Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960 AM. I have the real pleasure this evening of introducing you uh, to Bob McCowan, who probably most of you have heard uh, already on the radio uh, and on TV in the past, uh, one of uh, I think Canada's foremost uh, sports commentators, uh, a gentleman that I've had the pleasure of meeting a few times, and uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome him to my show. How are you today? I'm good, Crombie. Nice to see you. Everything's okay. Everything's good. I'm uh, here in my home office. I had to pack up my uh, my office downtown. I haven't uh, been traveling for the last two and a half months, so it's a little, been a little bit strange. But I got to yeah. go and take a swim just before I joined you on the radio. Yeah, strange for uh, all of us, I think. And I'm in my office, and I was just out by the pool myself. So Fantastic. You know, so I think everyone wonders, what are you up to now? Uh, well, I've been, uh, I've been busy, actually. You know, I took, uh, I kind of went into hiding for uh, 10 or 11 months, and uh, but uh, still working. I have a, a production company, Fadu Productions, and uh, we do uh, principally documentaries, mostly uh, sports and music. And we have a, I, our latest uh, project was a documentary on uh, the Go-Go's, uh, the uh, all-girl band from the um, I guess 1980s principally. The Go Go's. Yeah, what attracted it's... you to do a show on the Go Go's? Well, so the, it's a, they're a very interesting story because they were a first of their kind. You know, a bunch of girls who were into punk rock when it first started, who got together and formed their own band. They really couldn't play their own instruments. They were self-taught. So um, we just thought it was a fascinating story. And uh, we got Alison Elwood to direct it. And um, I don't know if you've seen the, the documentary on uh, the Eagles, but it's one of the best music docs I think ever produced. And Alison did that. And so we were lucky enough to get her to join our team. And uh, the documentary takes mm, pretty close to a year to put together. Now, you're known uh, primarily for sports. Are you also uh, big into uh, music as well? I didn't know that. Well, well, not really, not on a personal level. I, I fool around on the guitar a bit, and I have a bunch of musical friends and neighbors. I mean, Gordon Lightfoot lives down the road, and Alan Frew is a good friend of mine from Glass Tiger. I, in fact, I was on Alan's show yesterday. And so, um, yeah, I, was, uh, well, I, I love music, like I think everybody does. But we, we finished the Go-Go's Dock uh, late last uh, fall, early winter. Um, we were fortunate enough to get accepted at Sundance, which is Robert Redford's film festival in Utah. And it debuted there in January. We were supposed to go to Tribeca, which is uh, De Niro's festival in New York City, but that got canceled. And so I think the next stop for the doc is Showtime. And they've already bought it. And I think it will start airing in August, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, I went through the process with that. I own a winery. We've launched a new wine with our friends, The Tragically Hip. Fantastic. What's the winery? What's the winery? Is it Stonebridge that we see right behind you? Stony Bridge. Yeah, Stony, Stony Bridge. And um, it's the ninth oldest winery in Canada. I bought it in 2013. And we've had a relationship with the uh, Tragically Hip almost since the beginning. And uh, this is the third wine that we've now produced uh, for them. Excellent. Is it any good? Well, you're asking the wrong guy, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think they're all they're all really good. I I um, I can't drink red, so I can have a little taste of the red, but my taste buds are not um, educated to the quality of red wines, so I can't really tell you how good the red is. But the white is a Chardonnay. I just had the new Chard that just came out, just was bottled about a week ago. And I think it's fantastic. It might be as good as any one we've ever done. And the new one is uh, called Flamenco, and it's a rosé. And I've never been a rosé fan, but um, I've been consuming this one with some regularity, Crombie, I want you to know. Well, I don't know if you remember, but the first time I met you, I was kind enough to, you were kind enough to invite me to a wine tasting in your house. Yes, I do. It was a wonderful event. The wine was spectacular. The food was excellent and the hospitality was excellent. So thank you very much for that. You're most welcome. And maybe we'll do it again once all this nonsense is over with. I look forward to it. We're chatting with Bob McCowan tonight. We're going to take a break for messages. Stay with us. And we're going to now go into sports and what he thinks is going to happen. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Wire. It's a real pleasure of mine tonight to be chatting with uh, Bob McCowan, a gentleman that I've uh, 
admired and listened to for quite a while. And, uh, and, and, and Bob, you know, we all love sports. We all love uh, the thrill of seeing what's happening with uh, our favorite hockey team or our basketball team. And uh, with COVID-19, uh, obviously uh, nothing's been happening now. Starting uh, the teams, the leagues are just starting to announce that they're going to be reopening uh, training camps. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to uh, be watching um, Stanley Cup playoffs, uh, NBA playoffs this summer? Are we going to have fans in the uh, stands? Are we going to come back next season? What's your prediction? Well, based on what we're hearing now from the National Hockey League, they're, um, they're pretty much committed to come back. And um, you may be watching. Uh, maybe others will be watching, but I won't. Um, I think it's a mistake. Uh, it's based entirely on economics, which is, I mean, look, at sports is a business too. I'm well aware of that. I respect that. But this is a money grab. This is uh, money that would be lost from television rights, money that would be lost from advertisers if they don't play the games. This really isn't about anything other than that. And I'm not going to get sucked into it. And I'm not interested in, you know, I'll come in from the pool to talk to you, Crombie, but I'm not coming from the pool in, uh, in August to watch a hockey game on television at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So count me out on that. Baseball, so what, what's, baseball. what's the problem? Is it, is it the, the summertime or is it no fans in the audience? Well, there won't be any fans. There won't be any fans in the stands for um, a considerable period of time and probably – not until 2021. I'd be really shocked if we see fans even for NFL games this fall. Now the and NFL doesn't have a watch, problem with that. Sorry. Would you watch, would you watch football and hockey in the, in the fall with no fans? Or, so what's, what's your problem with the current situation? Is it the fact that it's the summertime or that there's no fans in the stands? No, I don't care about the fans in the stands. I don't think. I mean, now I have not been through that and I don't think you have either. So I don't know how I'll feel about, about that impact, but no, this is, this is strictly about a money grab. I'm not going to get sucked into it, and I'm not interested in watching hockey in August and September. And um, I probably feel I'm a little bit more of a basketball fan, so if there's a Raptors game on, well, you might drag me in now and then. But um, I'm certainly – I'm just principally against this. I don't see the problem with canceling the season and hanging up an asterisk and 20 years from now, you and I could sit down, well, as a couple of old guys, and, and talk about the year that wasn't finished. Remember that COVID thing and they didn't finish the season? Nobody was declared champion. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Do you? Um, actually, I do. I think that, uh, you know, there's only been one time there hasn't been a Stanley Cup awarded other than the year of the lockout. And that was during the uh, Spanish flu uh, pandemic. Uh, during uh, World Wars, uh, we had uh, hockey, we had Stanley Cup playoffs, we had Stanley Cups uh, uh, awarded. And, uh, you know, um, with respect, uh, I think that during the summertime, people typically watch a lot of sports, whether it's football um, or, you know, Canadian football or uh, whether it's the Summer Olympics. And I think a lot of people are very disappointed that the Summer Olympics are canceled and we're looking forward to watching some of those Summer Olympics. And, you know, when the Summer Olympics are on, you know, I may uh, not watch it in the middle of uh, the afternoon when I want to be out by the pool, but I catch a lot of the, the events uh, in the morning or in the evening, and I enjoy that. And so I think that that's going to be a good time to show some Stanley Cup playoffs. Well, I'll enjoy it because um, I won't be joining you. I can assure you of that. I, okay. uh, I, have, I have other things to do, other things to occupy my time. And one of the great, you know, we've seen lockouts and strikes repeatedly in sports. And uh, to be honest, the only thing that, the only way it affected me was it affected my, my broadcasting career because I had so much less to talk about. Yeah. But aside from that, I didn't miss it. So uh, I won't miss this one. What do you think about the long-term uh, prospects for live entertainment uh, of, of sports? Is it, is it going to come back? Uh, you know, you said that you don't expect to see people uh, in 2021. In 2022, will it be the same as it uh, has been in the past or is it going to be different? I have no way to know that. And I don't think anybody does. Um, I know I have many friends who are entertainers and um, they're all anxious to get back out there. You, you understand the music industry has changed so much over the years and, and, and we're in a, we're in a position now where a music artist has to perform live in order to generate revenue. They make nothing off. off. I mean, they don't make albums really anymore, or CDs or whatever. Yes, they release some stuff, but, their principal source of revenue now is touring. And that's why we see um, 
all of these acts who are well into their 60s and 70s, guys who have been around and women who've been around for 40, 50 years in the business, still out there performing because that's their source of income. I'm sure they love doing it, but this, this is a, an economic thing for them. It's, it's not a social thing. So I know they're, they're hurting and they miss it. Um, I'm, I'm very um, con well connected with the Celine Dion camp. I have a lot of friends in, in, uh, that um, are in her management team. Well, and Celine herself. And um, they're desperate to get back out there. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, but they don't know and I don't know when these acts can start to tour again. Because touring, the mandate in touring is sell tickets. And yeah, if you no. can't have anybody, in the, you can't have a concert with nobody in the, in the uh, arena or the stadium, right? You've probably seen the same pictures that I've seen of, uh, of during 1918, 1919 uh, football games taking place in the United States with people in the stands with masks on. Um, so, you know, uh, young people don't seem to uh, uh, either get sick and or get very sick and or have, uh, you know, death from this uh, virus. Uh, you and I are of a certain age that we probably are a little bit more, if not a lot more, susceptible to it. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that young people might come back and fill the, fill the stands and uh, some of the rest of us will only be in the suites or only in well, the rooms? Now you're getting into an economic question. How many 20, 25 year olds have got the kind of money to be able to afford to go to these games? I mean, there is, there is nothing cheap about live entertainment anymore. Uh, you want to go see a concert. Um, I know that my, my daughter has gone to see many acts, but I mean, Madonna was like $400. I've gone to see you too and spent $400. Uh, Celine has a world record. Celine Dion has a world record for uh, uh, gate receipts. Um, I think the average price of a Celine Dion ticket for her current tour is in the $300 range. Don't quote me. I may be wrong a little bit on that, but it's, it's up there. So are there enough young people and enough young acts? And do these young people have the resources to be able to support these acts? I, know, I don't know the answer. And if you look at who's on tour right now, it's Celine Dion, Fleetwood Mac, Rolling Stones. Um, I think the Eagles have come back. Um, it, it's, it's acts that appeal to, for lack of a better term, our generation, you know, the 40, 50 category who we assume have the disposable income to be able to afford it. Well, if we're not going, then is there enough there for them? I don't know. I, yeah, I you know, I you're, mean, asking, you're asking, asking me the wrong question. Yeah. I, I just, I don't have a feeling for it. I, I respect what we're going through. I've, I, you know, I've uh, been lucky so far as I assume you have. Um, I stay at home 99% of the time, uh, but I do go out. I play golf a few times. I've seen friends a few times. I've had people over here in small numbers on a few occasions. I'm not crazy about it, uh, but I'm careful. Well, I think that there's actually going to be a demand for live entertainment and live sports. I think there's oh, there's a demand. And there's, I, I don't question that there's, a, 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 and I'm not saying there's no demand. I think there is. I think there might be <coughs> some resistance. Excuse uh, me, but. I think there might be some resistance by people uh, above, you know, 55, 60, 65 to, to go. Um, if it's not safe, I think that uh, there might be uh, uh, more attendance by those people in suites. So uh, with people that they know and feel comfortable with. And I think that uh, the, the acts and the teams are going to have to price their uh, entertainment such that uh, the young people that uh, might be far more um, interested in going and willing to take the risk uh, um, can afford to go. And so I think it actually might create an interesting opportunity. No, I say good luck with that. I, I've, I, I've been around sports my entire life and uh, uh, greed, lust, and pestilence are uh, three, the three words that I use to describe professional sports. Greed, lust, and pestilence. <laughs> and, and, and greed is at the top of the list. Um, it's a rare thing when a sports organization lowers their ticket prices. There is true desperation when that happens. And uh, I'd rather see us all kind of ride this out carefully and get it over and done with. I don't even know if that's possible. But okay. 
So let's let's then uh, talk about what was happening with uh, live uh, sports. Um, you know, uh, outside of uh, COVID nineteen, attendance was uh, was flat. Um, wasn't uh, increasing dramatically uh, for a lot of uh, different sports leagues. Do you think that uh, we were sports were pricing themselves out of the market? Well, they're getting close. Um, I had an idea about uh, uh, well, almost forty years ago when when. Um, Before TSN launched, I was working at Global doing a show called Sportsline, and I heard that they, CRTC was going to take applications for an all-sports network, something that didn't exist in this country. And I started putting together a plan, and the plan I put together was to build a, an arena, a broadcast arena, that would be um, entirely private boxes. There would be no single seat, seating, no normal uh, seating. And we never got the license. TSN Labatt won the uh, won the license, so that never happened. But uh, that's really the direction we are going for the uber wealthy. Spending fifteen hundred, five thousand dollars for a ticket for one game is almost inconsequential. The dilemma you run into is when is is the, the common guy who could pay fifty and then was told it's a hundred, and now is being told it's two hundred, and you reach a point where you know. The guy says, I, I just, I don't have that much. As much as I want to go see the Leafs, the Blue Jays, the Argos, uh, the Raptors, the TFC, whoever you want to go see, I just don't have enough money to buy season tickets. And we're there. That exists right now. Um, and there's an adjustment to come. And the adjustment is going to be a separation of what I call church and state in sport. So the tickets for the private boxes are going to get more and more expensive. And the, and the tickets for the rest of us um, are either going to get flattened or are going to be reduced, probably slightly at first, but will be reduced. And I think that's an inevitability. The greed of these organizations to maximize revenues and increase revenues every year is no different than any other business, yours, mine, or anybody else's. And, and you really have to understand that that's what sports is about. At the end of the day, it's entertainment for you and I, but for the guy who owns that franchise and the people that are, are, are involved in operating that business, their mandate is to make as much money as they possibly can. And the athletes want to do the same thing. And I'm not being critical of that. I'm just, I'm just saying I recognize what the agenda is and – Everybody should understand what it is. And I think it's going to change, Brian. Yeah, no, I think it uh, is going to change. I, I got to tell you, I used to work uh, for the Molson companies that owned at the time the Montreal Canadiens, and a guy by the name of Ronald Corey was the president to the Canadiens at the time. And he would not allow someone in the lower bowl unless they paid good price. But he made sure that the upper bowl always had 20, 25% of uh, young people and he really worked very hard at that and his line and he did it uh, he said this in numerous meetings is those are the fans that are going to be in the lower bowl in 10 or 20 years and if yeah. i don't make the, if i don't make sure they're fans now i'm not going to have the business long term and uh, you know i remember i went golfing with him one time at a golf club where the average age was probably in excess of uh, of yours and mine and uh, he said this is not what i'm going to have in in uh, the montreal forum um, I'm not going to have an average age of this, of this like of this golf club. I'm going to have an average age that's far younger because that's how you keep a franchise uh, going. And then the other line that uh, he said was that if you wear a ball cap uh, or a, you know, a, a cap of the specific team when you're eight years old, that'll be your team forever, more than likely. And I want the kids in Montreal wearing Montreal Canadiens caps. Can't disagree with anything, uh, any of those philosophies. I subscribe to all of them and I, um, uh, indirectly um, use almost all of that in um, in my business operations. You know, I think you 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 have to, when possible, appeal to the younger generation and give them access. I I think Corey that had a um, smart man, smart man. So one of the things that's happened of late is uh, you know these uh, brokerage, um, uh, whether they be a Ticketmaster or a StubHub or something like that. Which yeah. not for every game and not for, you know, certainly Raptors playoffs games, but for a lot of games, we'll end up having tickets uh, on sale at a fairly low price. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, um, guys like you and I tend to buy our tickets for live entertainment a month or two months in advance. Millennials and uh, people younger than millennials buy their tickets 
within the last 48, 72 hours. And they buy them on these, uh, these uh, ticket uh, stub hub, uh, ticket master type places. And there they can get deals and they can get in for good prices. Yeah, so the, um, the philosophy of instant gratification uh, permeates for uh, young people, doesn't it? It sure uh, does. Whether it's, whether, it, whether it's for entertainment or purchasing tickets or deciding what to do, they decide what to do and then they do it like right away. And they have no interest in pre-planning or, um, or arranging things in advance. Um, and, you know, all of those entertainment vehicles uh, have to have to understand that that's that's the new psychology of of the young audience and at some point as you've alluded to the 25 year old will snap their fingers and they'll be 45 and they'll go from making uh, you know forty thousand dollars a year to one hundred forty thousand dollars a year and suddenly they're in a different snack bracket and suddenly they are the kind of client that um, a corporation aspires to have and you better be ready for them because they're probably not going to be uh, as receptive to giving you money six months before a season starts, which is really what has permeated uh, for us since we were able to go to games. Yeah. You know, the soon as the previous season, season ends, send in your money for next year, right? Yeah, no, the air of seasons tickets is, uh, is, uh, is diminished. There's no question. What about, um, you know, I don't know about uh, you, but my son, uh, when he's uh, entertaining himself at a hockey game or a football game or a basketball game, he's got like uh, his telephone going, he's got his TV going, he's got oh, his uh, fantasy hockey team. He's, he's cheering more for his fantasy team than he is for the real team in front of him. Well, uh, that's a generational thing, obviously. I mean, we didn't grow up with cell phones. I mean, I, I, I think the first actual cell phone I saw was in the movie Wall Street when uh, Gordon Gecko was walking along the beach with that, you remember that big ass phone he had? It was massive. Yeah, and I, I think that's the first, I, I may be wrong, but I think that's the first cell phone I ever saw. And of course I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And now of course we have, you know, something like that size, right? And, and, and the kids live on it. it the, I have, I think I have six or seven televisions in this house. I have two young people, one 18, 124, living with me. They both have televisions in their room and never turn them on. If they want to watch something, they watch it on their phone. If they, and, and while they're watching something on the phone, I think they can still text and whatever else they can do on the but phone. It's not, just, it's not just the phone. It's the fact that the fantasy team that they're involved in picking is more important to them than the yeah. actual team. And, and I think there's this desire that they want to be you. They want to be a general manager. They want to be, you know, more active in the, in the management and selection of the team. Well, but it's, all, it's still about instant gratification. I, I don't pretend to know much about this stuff, but um, it seems to me that most of the fantasy pools that are the biggest are not ones where you enter and don't have a result until the end of the season. It's the kind of thing where you can, you can act and do things during a game predicting plays, trading players, whatever the hell they do, and, and get an instant response to it. And, and that's really what this is all about. One of the industries, the sports industries, that suffered greatly as a result of this instant gratification uh, era that, in which we live is horse racing. It's 22 minutes between, a horse, between horse races. And young people simply will not sit in the dancing form in order to prepare to bet on the next race. You know, if they had a race every minute, they'd say, well, why don't you run them every 30 seconds? Why don't you run two races at once? Why don't you run five races at once? You get more, 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 faster, 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 faster. And, um, well, look, I guess, you know, when we were young, there was a generational gap. And now what we are experiencing with our kids is the same thing, only, in spades, 10 times faster, 10 times bigger. Technology has its rewards, but it also has its limitations. We're chatting tonight with Bob McCowan, a famous uh, sports uh, commentator in Canada. We're going to take a break for some messages and get right back. And I'm going to ask him a little bit about his career. Stay with us.
Well, welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Wire, Saga 960. I'm having, I think, a fascinating conversation for me, at least, uh, tonight with uh, a gentleman that I have a lot of time for, Bob McCowan. Uh, Bob, how did you get started in, uh, in sports and in commentating? Well, uh, I, um, I, I'm not going to say I'm the only one, but I fell into it. It was a complete accident. I never aspired to be a broadcaster. I never even thought about being a broadcaster. Um, I was a little jock when I was young, played all sports. I uh, picked up a guitar when I was in my early teens, probably, and then, you know, kind of went down the music path for a little bit. Um, I just, I fell into a job uh, in broadcast, well, at a radio station in sales, actually, and hated that. One thing led to another, and I walked in and I said, I quit. And uh, the, my boss, who was the sales manager and the sports director, um, said, well, why are you going to quit? And I said, because I hate doing this. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go and see if I can get a job at a peanut whistle radio station in Saskatchewan or Manitoba and, and see if I'm any good at that. And if, in, in a few weeks, I'll know whether I'm any good. And, and if I am, fine. And if I'm not, I'll just quit. And he said, well, you can't quit. And I said, well, you don't have this quitting thing figured out. You don't get to tell me what I can and can't do. I quit. And he said, no, I'm going to put you on as a sportscaster here on the radio station. And that was CKFH, Foster Hewitt Station. And literally overnight, poof, there I am. No training, no knowledge, no, I mean, I was a sports fan, but that's all. Yeah. And then it progressed, and a few months later, we launched a talk show, and then it became the first nightly talk show on radio, a sports talk show in Canada. And uh, that's really how it started. And, um, and then, of course, a few different steps along the way. And, and so when did you go on TV from radio? Started on Global in 1981. I launched Sportsline, which was the first magazine in that um, I actually, was actually my idea. Guy from Global calls me one day and he says, how'd you like to do a 15 minute horse racing show every night? And I said, not particularly, but I'll talk to you about it. So I went in that very day, call me in the morning. That afternoon, probably three o'clock, I went in and sat down with him. And while I was driving in, I thought, I don't wanna do a horse racing show. It's gotta be something I can spin this into. So I sat down and I said to him, look, uh, horse racing, I, you know, I'm okay, but it doesn't have a big fan base. Why don't we do a half hour sports, like a super sports cast? Back then, Pat Marsden and Brian Williams were on CBC and CTV. I mean, I had that backwards, but but they were the two principal sports casters in uh, Toronto. And so I said, and they and they had shows on at 11:30 at night. And I said, let's go up against them, and let's do a full half hour. They each did five or 10 minutes. Anyway, he bought this to my great shock. And so in three weeks, literally three weeks, we put together the show from dead nothing. And it, uh, it became a hit. We had more than a million viewers a night. We had uh, major sponsors that jumped on board. There was a, actually a bidding war uh, for it. And uh, Sportsline, I think, lasted 25 years. I was there three. And I, it, and I quit as it turned out, but, um, it was, um, it was sort of revolutionary and it served to spawn the growth or the, the, not the growth, the development of TSN, which then spawned Sportsnet. If, uh, you know, I, you can never prove this, but at least theoretically, if Sportsline did not exist, TSN and Sportsnet may not exist today. That's where the idea came from. If you can do a half hour, you can do more than a half hour. And so the CRTC put out um, uh, applications and uh, Labatt won the bid with TSN. Now your shows have always been extremely popular. I've uh, enjoyed watching them. What do you think made them so, so interesting and attractive to the, to the viewer? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy that question. You know, I mean. Uh, you were different. You were different and very different. How were you different? Well, I don't know if I was different. I, I didn't, I wasn't different deliberately. I, I mean, I was different deliberately because I created this broadcast persona. When I first started doing talk, I mean, Brian, I used to get two calls in two hours. 
there's a lot of filling goes on when you're when you have two calls in two hours and I came home one night and I it was a Friday night as a matter of fact and I said to myself McCowan you are going to get fired because nobody is listening to you and nobody is calling you and you're too boring and you're too dull so I decided to create a character as an actor would who goes on stage you know De Niro you see De Niro on stage or any other great actor or any even in a movie and you know that's not them they have created this character and this character has um, I mean it's written down these are the characteristics that this character has even though you don't see those so I wrote down all these characteristics for the character so he's gonna be the obnoxious arrogant know-it-all talk show host doesn't suffer fools lightly hangs up on people is a, a miserable SOB and Monday I literally transformed myself into that guy and you know what happened the phone started to ring and that's literally how this thing grew now as the years went by and you know I kind of established myself in the business to some extent I, I backed off a little bit on that. Every once in a while, you know, old school Bob pops in and I'll yell at somebody, but no, not really, not that much. And I learned, um, I learned a bunch of things. I learned the importance of, of being a good interviewer. And I spent a lot of time listening to people who I respected as interviewers. And the second thing was I learned that athletes in the middle of their careers who all go to media school, have nothing interesting to say. Well, they may have interesting things to say, but they're not going to tell you. And so I said, to hell with them. I'm not going to have them on anymore. So rare was the day when an active athlete came on my program. And it, they were few and far between. Give me the president of the team. Give me the general manager of the coach. Give me the, the, the commissioner of the league. Give me a, a, almost anybody else, but don't give me active players. Now, once a player retired, all of a sudden, I was interested because now they could tell stories and would tell stories that they wouldn't tell when they were playing. So that was, you know, secret. There it is. That was, if there's a secret, that was it. And, and I, I thought didn't... the uh, arrogant know-it-all guy was the real you. I'm just uh, flabbergasted. Actually, I'm just kidding. Um, I, you, the way I would have described you actually isn't uh, the obnoxious, arrogant uh, know it all, but it would be sort of irreverent and uh, provocative and doesn't suffer fools uh, well, but you know, tells it like it is. Um, if someone is off base, they, you would tell them. Um, and I think yeah, that but that's not my, I, I swear to you, it's not my character. It was still, that was part of the creation and the dilemma. I, I always describe this as radio. I used to say radio Bob and home Bob were two entirely different people. And um, uh, my wives, uh, would probably tell you the exact same thing. So, um, you know, I, I, I would, I literally would take the hat off when I got home and put the home Bob hat on, you know, and he's pretty calm and pretty boring, but then you got to snap back in the next day. And when I'm out in public and people recognize me and television is a thing, you know, and I get recognized all the time, they expect to see that guy they saw on TV. Right. So now I have to snap back into TV Bob. So this going back and forth, um, among other things, messes up your mind and your and, and your life a little bit. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't even think about it now. It just kind of happens instinctively. So I find some of what you say is, is is absolutely true. Maybe all of it. Maybe I'm the wrong person to judge myself at this point. I have no idea who I am. I have found it interesting that so many people want to discuss, listen to discussion about, uh, argue about sports um, and, uh, and not just watch it. And, and, you know, I think you proved that with your shows over the years. Um, people love their sports and, 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 you know, I think it's sort of uh, similar to my son's desire to play his fantasy uh, teams. People want to get more involved in sports than just watching it. How do we get them to do that? Well, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things there. How do you get people more involved? Uh, that's a real dilemma. I mean, um, I'm, I don't know. I don't know enough about your background, but for me, I like. I got out of school at three thirty or whatever. They, whenever they let me out, and in the summertime, I grabbed my baseball glove and we played baseball till dinner. And then we ran and went inside, ate as fast as we could, came back outside, 
and played baseball until, you know, the streetlights came on. And in the wintertime, it was hockey. And that cycle continued all the time, all the time, all the time. You know, but we grew up in an era where there were three television networks in the U.S., ABC, NBC, CBS. That's all, just three. And CBC in Canada. I can remember before CTV even existed. I'm pretty sure CTV was launched in 1960. So um, now I barely remember it, but uh, so we didn't have all the distractions. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. We had friends. And if you wanted to socialize, you went outside and you did stuff. And we played all these games, these sports. Today, you've got to drag a kid kicking and screaming from his, his portable screen in order to get him to just, just go outside. You know, my kids on a beautiful day will sit inside with their computers and cell phones and won't spend a second out in the backyard. That makes no sense to me. I don't know about you, makes no sense to me whatsoever. We get so few of these days, take advantage of it. This, this technology is gonna be around 24 hours of the day. You can stay up till four o'clock in the morning now that COVID's here, nobody cares, and, and, and play with your phone or your computer. I don't know how you convert them back. When is the last time, I'll ask you a question, Crombie. When is the last time you saw a ball hockey game on the street? Um, that's a good question. Um, just a couple of days ago, I was actually driving and oh, I, had to stop on really? a, I had to stop on a street as they, uh, as they had to clear the, uh, the ball hockey game. Well, uh, let me tell you my experience and I'm not lying. 20 years. I have not run and I drive, I used to drive. You live in a long. different neighborhood than me though. Well, whatever. I, I drive home from a young and bluer, uh, well, um, Jarvis and bluer technically, where Rogers was, drive back home, about a 17, 18 minute drive, and I go through neighborhoods. Now, okay, they're inner city neighborhoods. Well, they're more downtown, not inner city, downtown here. I haven't, in my neighborhood, anywhere I've gone, I have not seen a net or two nets out. I don't see baskets on, in, uh, in driveways. It just doesn't exist anymore. That's how we lived. We had the nets out every single night, Saturday, Sunday, and you know what happens. You know, that famous phrase, you're, on, you're, you're in the middle of a game and somebody will yell, car, and you got to pick the nets up and move them off to the side so the car can drive by, and then you put the nets back, back down. I, it doesn't exist really anymore. I don't know how to get kids active and involved because it means they have to give up their their drug and their drug is technology yeah well i live i live in suburbia and uh it may not be as bad uh, in suburbia um you know seriously i was out driving uh, just on the weekend and uh people uh dads and kids were out playing uh, with basketball hoops that were up to the side of the uh the road and uh, and there were nets up not a lot but there were uh, it was a beautiful weekend, one of the first beautiful weekends. And so I think a lot of people were uh, out. I think one of the negatives of this COVID-19 situation, obviously, is that you can only play with, uh, you know, your family members um, and, uh, and the, the whole street getting together to well, play. Theoretically, with. yeah. Theoretically, you can only play with your family members. Yeah. I think uh, we've all seen uh, uh, groups of, uh, of kids and people. Well, we saw it on the weekend, right, with the, with the park. It was a yeah. region park. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was out. Uh, I was out biking um, on uh, on the weekend uh, through uh, one of the big conservation areas near me, and you know what? There were a lot of people out, but you know, still probably twenty percent of what would typically be out on that day because they had closed up the parking lot and wouldn't allow people to to drive to the park. Just people yeah. that could walk or bike to the park could go, and people were respectful. So yeah, there were lots of people, uh, and and this wasn't Trinity Bellwoods, which is what you're probably referring to. Oh yeah, but right. People were. You know, and, and as we were biking, as people were running and walking on the paths, you could purposefully see them veering away. So they were a good six feet away. So, you know, I think uh, people want to get out. They want to exercise. They want to do stuff. You know, my biggest, I'm, I'm, I'm back on a couple of soccer fields um, and um, no one's out playing soccer because there's no organized soccer. So that is, that is a challenge. No, but you know, I think people are still playing. I think hockey, for an example, 
minor hockey is expensive, more expensive today. And so therefore, you know, clearly basketball and, and the Raptors have been uh, uh, one of the reasons, one of the cows for that, but it's also cost. Um, so soccer and, uh, and, and basketball are probably more prevalent uh, um, than, than hockey just because of cost. But it's more, it's, it's, I think that people want to listen to guys like you talk about sports. They want to get on their phones and play fantasy football. They want to interact when a generation ago, we were okay just sitting and watching. So I do think there's, there's a desire to be more involved somehow in sports. It's got to be a more participative kind of, uh, of environment. If we're I don't disagree with you, Kwame. I'm just saying I don't. You ask me how we get to, that to happen, and I don't have an answer to that question. That's I mean, it's as simple as that. I, I agree with you. Physical exercise is important, and it is it, it's it's a it's a developmental thing in addition to a physical thing. It develops you in social skills. It develops you mentally. There are so many ad advantages to participating in sports. And, um, you know, I don't know if you think of golf as a sport, but I still play golf and I play it regularly. It is my passion now. And I've been out several times already this year. Um, I, I don't play golf. I struggle golf. <laughs> well, we all do that. Uh, I mean, you want to do stuff. You want to do something physical. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to just lie on the couch and look at a, a, you know, a four inch screen. No question. And, but I don't know how to get them off of it. It's like, it's like a drug. Um, you know, when you're addicted, you're addicted. And it is not easy to get somebody to quit. Now, what's the future for you? You've launched a podcast, I understand. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, what's my future? Um, I'm hoping to live tomorrow. I'm hoping to wake up in the morning and uh, maybe have a cup of tea. Uh, we did the podcast thing. We were planning something different than COVID hit. Um, we changed our plans. Uh, so now we have a thing called, uh, okay, you got five minutes. And what it, basically, it's a five-minute show. And we invite people to come on. Um, it's in a format such as many of your audience is watching right now on Zoom. So I'm sitting right where I'm sitting now in front of my computer. I can see them. They get to ask me questions for five minutes. And that's it. Away you go. And there's a show every week. Now, it is dependable time more than one show a day. We'll see how it goes. We're only in day three today. Um, and uh, we have other plans that are possible too. So uh, stay tuned. And as for getting in terms of getting back into traditional broadcasting, um, I've talked to several companies. I've had four offers. And to be honest, the snack bracket that I am used to is not a snack bracket that they want to contribute to. So uh, until they wise up and realize that you got to spend money to make money, I'll, uh, I'll stay off of traditional broadcasting. That's well, I for, one, uh, I, I for one miss you on traditional broadcast. Well, We're going to take another break. Sorry? We're going to take another break and come back more. Uh, for oh, some more time. still? Okay, great. So stay with us. Sorry about my phone. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crabby Radio. We're chatting tonight with uh, Don McCowan, uh, f famous uh, sports uh, commentator on uh, television and radio in uh, in Canada. Um, now, you don't need adjectives, please, Crabby. You can do without the adjectives, you know. And you could probably say former now too, instead of okay. like I, you know, I'm theoretically not doing it anymore. Well, anyway, I'm not. I'm sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. I think everyone wants to, to hear what you got to say. Let me ask you a couple of, uh, of uh, topical, provocative questions, uh, if I could, just uh, as we close the show. Uh, sure. Don Cherry, was he dealt with uh, correctly? Yeah. Um, Graves is a pal. Um, I, I love him. I have a lot of time for him. Um, he goes over the edge sometimes. Uh, we all try. Well, we don't all, but Don and I try and live as close to the edge as we can. And he has gone well over the edge on more occasions than I have. I think that's fair to say. And that's not a criticism of him. It's just a reality. And this time he did the wrong thing at the wrong time. I am told that he was given an opportunity to apologize and keep his job. And he declined to do that, which is his right. Uh, but Sportsnet felt that they couldn't tolerate um, the situation any longer. So they let him go. And... 
uh, that is their right as well. Kneeling for the national anthem, what do you think of that? I understand it. Um, I'm not a national anthem guy. Uh, when we were younger, we used to go to movies, and if you went to the late movie, which usually started around 9 or 9.30, what used to come on, Crombie, after the movie ended? You remember? No, what was that? The national anthem. Right. They used to play the national the anthem. And what did everybody do? Like, so the, the, the movie would end and everybody knew that the national anthem was going to be played. And as soon as the movie ended, and I mean the credits started to roll, people filed out of that theater as fast as they could. Why? Because they didn't want to stick around for one minute and stand there and watch the national anthem. And I'm, I'm all for patriotism. And there's a time and a place for a national anthem. But it is not before every gathering, every concert, every sporting event, uh, uh, and on and on and on and on and on. So that's number one. I hate anthems. Number two, the reason why the players were, were kneeling is because of the injustices being done to the African-American community. And um, you would have to be a complete idiot to deny that fact. Um, and is it their right? I think it is absolutely their right. I think it is, it, it's a mandate almost for them. In some way, you have to show when you are unhappy and when you believe the system is failing you, um, your group, your kind, your whatever. Whether it's a, a, a generational thing, a skin tone thing, a religious thing, whatever it is, there's a time and a place. And um, I think it was their right. And um, I think it was absurd that the National Football League was allowed to demand that they not do it. And it's, it's a conservative Republican attitude in America under the most moronic embarrassment of a president that my country, because I was born in the U.S. and I'm still a U.S. citizen as much as I love Canada, I am embarrassed for the United States of America for the moron that they put in office. And, and, uh, and the U.S. kowtowed to Trumpisms. And it's, it was shockingly embarrassing. Shockingly. What about uh, women sportscasters in the dressing room? Wow. Well, I'm not an athlete uh, standing around with nothing on. And I'm not a female who um, is being asked to go into the dressing room. Uh, and I, so I, I hate to not have an answer for you, but I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. I do not know. If you were at a golf club, and I only do that, I'm trying to come up with a, a comparative. If you're at a golf club and you're in the men's locker room and you're walking into the shower and there's 10, 15, 20 guys who are buck naked coming in or going out of the shower and a woman walks in, how would you feel? Would you just walk up, hi, how you doing? No. Nope. Would you grab a towel? Yes. I don't think it's a comfortable environment for either party, for the male athlete, or for the female. But I don't know the right answer to this question. I certainly respect, I have many friends, female friends, excellent sports writers, broadcasters, journalists. No difficulty with having them you know, on the air, on in print, whatever. I don't know whether I would ask a woman to go into a male dominated environment like that. Um, I know that I, I've been around some tough broads, and I say that with respect, who could walk in there and wouldn't phase them a bit. But what you don't want is a sensitive woman who is told that that's her job and is forced to do that and doesn't is not comfortable with it. It's a terrible, terrible dilemma. So answer, I don't know. Okay, my last question. Why did you take on uh, Don Cherry's job in Hockey Night in Canada? You'd be great. Uh, mm, look, uh, 
Uh, first of all, it hasn't been offered. People say to me all the time, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Well, you know what, dummies? You can't just do whatever you want to do. Somebody has to want you to do it. I think you'd be the salvation for Hockey Night in Canada. Well, I think they, I don't think they'd give me that opportunity. I, I, they, I, I, will, I will tell you a very quick story at the end of this. Um, a few years ago, they asked me to be on the, um, the ridiculous draft day, or is it trade, no, trading deadline day, trading deadline day that TSN and Sportsnet spend millions of dollars producing. And of course, all the guys are dressed up in their suits and ties. And you know, you know me, I'm kind of a dirt disturber. So I walk in in a pair of blue jeans and a leather jacket and I sit down and of course they're all aghast and they throw to me for the, they're, they're sitting there talking for two hours about the, oh, the merits of this trade that doesn't happen in that trade and all, they're taking it all so seriously. And I walk in and I just say, what a pile of crap this is. What a complete and utter waste of time. These networks are gonna spend tens of millions of dollars to give you nothing, nothing. A bunch of guys named who are gonna be traded for a bunch of guys named what? And it's not gonna happen until three o'clock right before the deadline. And the impact to all the teams involved is gonna be zero, nothing. And they're making a big thing out of garbage and you are the stupid people for sitting there and watching this all day. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's basically what I said. So I was off. They went to somebody else. I was supposed to come on an hour later. Guess what? They never put me back on. So um, I think I've answered that question for you. I don't think they are. I don't think they have the guts to put me on. Don Cherry is an institution and a hockey guy, and he knows the game a million times better than me. The things that I'd say are things they wouldn't want me to say. And it's not because I defend anybody. The only people I defend would be the National Hockey League and Sportsnet. Those are the people that I would defend. Um, it would take somebody with mucho cojones to put me in that chair. And uh, don't hold your breath, Crombie. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Well, it might take uh, mutual cojones, but I think you're, uh, you would have a positive impact on the ratings. And so therefore, the ratings would go up, the advertisers would love it, and they would just have to hold their, uh, their breath and their noses a few times. Anyway, Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really uh, enjoyed uh, the chat, getting to know you a little bit better. And I'm sure everyone wants to see you back as soon as possible on something, whatever that something is. Well, the podcast exists. Uh, take what you can get for the time being. Um, otherwise, come to my golf club. You can watch me play on Saturday morning. Thanks very much. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Bob. Thanks for joining us.